go into a city that's set on a hill. Its ruler and maker is the Lord God above. Oh, I'm going to a city and it's set on a hill. And someday I'll be in heaven and there'll be no sorrow there. Oh, I'm going to a city. It lies four square. The gates are made of jasper and I'll see Jesus. Hello, everybody. God bless you today. This is Susan Puzio, your revolutionary reformer. <laughs> and here we are again with another exciting episode of Prophetic News Radio. And we have moved over, in case some of you are still trying to find us on Blog Talk Radio, we stopped broadcasting on Blog Talk Radio, and we went over to Spreaker, and we're still on iTunes. It's Prophetic News Radio, if you're looking for us on iTunes, and so you can find us there. Also, we have our two books on Amazon, Paula White, President Trump's Pastor. How did that happen? And... Seed faith, can a man bribe God? Can a man really give God enough money to make him do things for you? That seems to be the way things are being taught these days, but of course it's not true. You can't bribe God. And uh, the way people are being taught these days. Also, we have our YouTube channel, Prophetic News TV, under my name also, Susan Puzio, and Greedy Preachers TV. Greedy Preachers TV. So those things are out there. Our website to propheticnews.com. And there's some great articles on there from years and years gone by. Hundreds of, of articles that have been collected over the years. Not necessarily written by me. But by many other people that have been doing this kind of work for many years. And reporting on the church and your, the changes that have taken place in the body of Christ. The, the world is full of chaos and confusion, but so is the church. And how did that happen? So let me bring my guest on. We have our guest, our very special guest for you today, Jackie Alnor, another revolutionary reformer who's been trying to revolutionize <laughs> the church for many years. I have tried, Susan. <laughs> you really have. You, you've... Just, I don't know how much I've accomplished. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. You wonder, but there, there, you can tell by how many people are your friends on Facebook. Obviously, if you didn't have, what, 3,000 friends or something on there, Thereabouts, thereabouts. Yeah, so there's some, there's at least two thousand of them like you. Oh, I hope so. Yes, I, I at least can get a third of them. And or that's a, that's a mega thirds. church. Yeah. Well, it's nice to be your special uh, guest. I feel very <laughs> special <laughs> to be here. Yes. Yeah, I know. You know, it's been a crazy month in the past month, hasn't it? I mean. Gee, it's it's hard to even watch the news anymore, isn't it? I wonder if people are able to keep their composure when we're having a UFO assault, if, if balloons and things. Yeah, and the crazy, crazy uh, Biden says it's aliens. <laughs> yeah, Where did yeah. that come from? I, I think he's an alien. Yeah, he's, I know. He's he a might walk-in. be one of those they lizards. Call walk-ins <laughs> when they possess somebody. <laughs> Yeah, he, he must be a one of those walk He's one of those lizard people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he must be one of those walk-ins because you know he's not running the country. No, and, he, and he's a really ugly puppet. I mean, they could have gotten something prettier to do their talking for them, couldn't they? No, I, there's a reason. It's madness. There's a reason why they would pick such a person. It's yeah, because it is the whole madness. thing's falling apart. It's just... You, you you look at the created chaos 
the, the, the created, there was a book written years ago called The Planned Destruction of America. Mm -hmm. And it was really prophetic, the way, the title. And it was written, I think, in the 1980s or the early 1990s. So we're seeing it. It's a planned destruction. Yeah. It's interesting because my old friend Constance Cumbie, who wrote the book, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, yeah. her, her follow-up book was called A Planned Deception. Wow. And it was really uh, kind of a messed up book. It, it really needed an editor because the uh, there were so many typos and stuff in it, it was actually kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Well, didn't she have a word processor at the time? Oh, of course, we don't gosh, didn't have one. Yeah, we well, none. we're talking the 1980s. Oh, yeah, that uh, you was, know. it was hard to edit things back then. Yeah, I, th I think we started to get, what, Word Star or something like that or <laughs> Word Perfect, but yeah, yeah I don't know what happened. Yeah, it was a long happened. evolution before. Now it's it's pretty good where you can spell check and do that. But oh, yeah, Constance Cumby, she was like the uh, queen of exposing the new age movement so whatever became of her because we don't really hear about her anymore yeah she's on my friends list and her husband recently passed away oh but you know she's getting up there in age let's face it and of course aren't we all but she's yeah. quite a bit older than we are and um unfortunately she decided to become a catholic yeah that's unfortunate but she then again she assured me that she doesn't believe in their doctrine. She just likes to, she likes the ritual and the rigmarole or whatever, but she doesn't, she's not a true Catholic. She doesn't really believe their doctrines. Uh, that's a shame. You wonder how people get, they, they have so much good information that they put out. Of course, she was, when did her book come out first? I think it was in about 1983. Oh, wow. So she was way ahead of her time. Well, she, she was, the leading edge of the of the whole exposure of the new age movement yeah. into the church at least i mean you know they might have talked about it out in the secular world but they weren't critical of it and she exposed a lot of a lot of it so she did a really good job but she got beat up by the church over it yeah she yeah. got beat up but then that, that might have led to her wanting to go to this religious false religious system <laughs> Well, it didn't help that her two best friends were nuns. No, that doesn't help. No. <laughs> <laughs> but she did good research. She really yeah, she did, inspired yeah. me at, in my early walk when I was, after reading her book, you kind of opened your eyes to all of this stuff. It was kind of blind back at the time. Now it's in your face everywhere. Now it's just part of the mainstream. But back in those days... You, you didn't notice it unless somebody pointed it out to you. And it's interesting that she would call it the hidden dangers of the rainbow because that was before the rainbow coalition. That was before the pride rainbow. Yeah, pride, yeah, it pride was. Flag. Yeah. So she was well ahead of her time. And I don't think people in the church has given her enough credit for that. She, she opened it up. She blew the whistle on it and she really did her research and, uh, she read, I, th I think one of her biggest problems, and it's a, it's something to watch out for when you're doing research, is she got so in, in, entrenched into the books and all the information involving the occult and the new, and of course the new age movement and theosophy and all of these things that it, she, I don't think she, and I, I know now in retrospect, she was not staying in the word every day and, and getting washed after being bathing in this. Yeah, garden. that's true. Yeah, you have to be careful because it, it's so disgusting what they're doing. And yeah, you ha you do. You have to be you have to be careful because you don't want those things staying in your head. And right? they do the, the things stay in your head and and uh, you you almost think yeah, is there any hope? sometimes because of the way everything looks so chaotic and it brings on paranoia and, yeah, and she really did become very paranoid and it doesn't mean I, I used to love walter martin used to say well just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you <laughs> well the thing is back in that day you didn't have the internet 
and people would lie. Like if you would say, well, Kenneth Copeland said this, because I remember telling a friend of mine that loved Kenneth Copeland. And my, I, it might have been like in the 1990s, early 1990s or so, and she, I said, well, you know Kenneth Copeland said this. I can't even remember what I, I said when I was figuring out he was false. And she said, oh, I never heard him say that. So in her, back in her day, when she would say things, even though she had all the documentation and the footnotes and everything, people tended not to believe it because it, it seemed so far out. I know. And that's what got me in the, in the mid eighties. Once I was got a VCR, I started recording these things because I get the same flack, you know? Oh, well, I don't believe you. He never said that. Well, I made sure everything I quoted, I had the, the video or the newsletter I got on all of their news lists. And so I could show it in their own writing or I could show it in their videos. And that, that very thing you just said is what inspired me to do all of that, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. So even though she was uh, ahead of her time with her research, it was, I, I, I remember being, of course, I was saved in 81. So I remember seeing her and she was all over the place on television, on the Christian channels that had her anyway, our local channel, I think had her on a couple of times. I don't think TBN, did they ever have her on? Oh, if so, maybe once. Yeah, that would be it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think she might've been on there once with, with uh, Dave Hunt after his book came out. Uh, and then of course I know Dave Hunt was early on was blackballed. Yeah. 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 So that, that was it. Then you couldn't really get the exposure because back in that day, if people saw you on television, it made you believable in a way, in a sense. It was, and it still does because you could see, if you look at the financial statements of some of these television ministries, yikes, they're taking in 50 million, 100 million, 200 million, 600 million people donate to these TV ministries. So it's still... It's still kind of that way well it is that way i would say as far as trying to get to uh, get exposure for your message if you can't get on these networks you but her book did end up being um you know on christian bestseller list it did sell very well i know yeah well when i checked back in the day i, I quit looking after it got up to six hundred thousand. And and Southwest Radio Church that had the daily program, they would have her on very frequently, and, yeah. and she became very good friends with with David Weber, the son of the founder of Southwest Radio Church. And then I was involved with helping them and 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 Cumbie, uh run their tables and and go with them to, to their conferences and help them and everything. So. Yeah, that was that was early on in my own walk. They were important to me. Yeah. Well, that was that that was a good broadcast, even though they got hung up on a couple of things later, which yeah was a shame. But yeah, I used to enjoy that Southwest Radio Church. I like this one uh, that came from what was it, the Pacific Garden Mission, Unshackled. Unshackled. I that. <laughs> yes, that yes, that was great. I love that. But yeah, it's it's a shame because it, it seems like. Maybe now she would be more accepted. We need more people in this kind of doing this kind of work because there's not that many people out there. And sometimes, even if people get involved in doing apologetics or polemics, whatever they call it that, or sure. discernment ministry, that either they get discouraged or they just decide, well, it's just not worth it. So, and they quit. It's an easy thing to get burnt out in. Yeah. A a lot of people, they they don't get that balance of word and research. And you absolutely have to, because you have to stay in the word every day, especially when you start looking at evil things. And I've seen so many people through my decades of involvement with this, you know, totally either getting off or burnt out or even apostatizing from the faith. I mean, we've talked before about Kim Miller. 
Yeah. Oh. You know, and he, he was exposing the New Age movement and doing all that kind of stuff, as I recall. Yeah. He would yeah. get his cassette tapes. And what, he decided he was Elijah and went to Israel? I, I You know, he, he really went wacky. Oh, I know. That was such a shame. When I had my... Uh television program in, in uh, Denver and Aspen back in the late, well, about 1987. He was a guest of mine. Oh, we, did, we just had a great time talking, and he had such a great testimony. And then he started putting out those cassette tapes, and we would talk on the phone for hours sometimes, laughing and, and enjoying the fellowship. And then all of a sudden, wow, I mean, he just lost his mind and that's happened to a lot of people i mean in my opinion it happened to tex mars yeah it did happen to tex mars and yeah he 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 went off the deep end yeah, and really did. became anti-semitic yeah, and terrible anti-semitic yeah yeah and really involved in plagiarism and 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 sensationalism and you know all kinds of what he just went it went wacky and again if you aren't grounded in the word you can't even do this and if you're not called because i i don't care what anybody says it, it it you know maybe it's not listed in you know in in the bible as far as one of the offices you know like apostle prophet yeah, teacher yeah, yeah. blah 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 it doesn't say watchmen we're, we're all supposed to be watchmen but some are gifted for that and others aren't at the leading guide leading edge of it and so, and those who pretend to be and get in it and aren't called to it, they don't last. No, they don't last. But what about, uh, do you think Tex Morris, what, what was that book he wrote about the New Age? Do you remember the title of that? Oh, oh, boy. Um, I can look it up while we're yeah, talking. Yeah, I was going to say, I should know because it's, uh, I, I have it in my uh did, library downstairs. Did, yeah, I have it in my <laughs> library, too. I still have it. But did he, do you think he actually wrote those books? I, that, that's, I can't say. I, what I think and what I know would be two different things uh, because it depends on how early he, he wrote it. He, he, I know, he took my um, great apostasy video that I produced in 1999 and he used all 99 of my, I have 99 clips in that in that production and he took them all and put it and took all of my commentary out and put in his own commentary and then and then promoted it as he really did all this this research you know yeah tex <laughs> sure you did <laughs> and he added well, a few how more did he get from, away uh, with that because there was no he, copyright well, because, on your research no i can't own those clips because oh. I took those clips off the air. I, I, you know, here in 1999, I had like 15 years of documenting clips of my, you know, pr pr just totally involved in taping everything. And, uh, you know, I'm Sky Angel on. Yeah, TV what happened to Sky Angel? Then. Pardon? What happened to Sky Angel? They, they went away, kind of, didn't they, Sky Angel? Uh, that, yeah, that I don't know what happened. See, a lot of, yeah, I have a whole library of tapes from sky angel and uh and you know i they, they think they got bought out and the name changed or something yeah they, they promised it was going to be forever when there was a lifetime <laughs> partnership you could buy <laughs> that didn't uh, last very long right yeah, yeah tex morris he had a lot of circle of intrigue i mean he had a lot of books i'm trying to find that one though he did on the new age mystery um, let me see here. It was is. it the mask? Mystery of the Mark of the New Age. He had well, Mystery Mark, that sounds familiar. Yeah, but there was something else. I'm still trying to find it. But there's so many. He had quite a few books. But yeah, he started out good. He was very interesting. And he yeah. seemed like he really knew what he was talking about. And then, wow, he just went crazy with hating the Jews and blaming them for yeah. everything. And yeah. No, it was awful. And he was good friends with, with Constance Cumby. And so that's how I met him. So he knew me even when he borrowed. I, I think he might have asked if he could use some of my clips. And I said, yeah, feel free. So he felt free. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it. <laughs> yeah, some clips, not all 99 of them. Yeah. Well, that's it. There, there's someone else in your life that kind of did something like that, too.
No. <laughs> we probably yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, but uh, yeah. But, but then again, I didn't. Oh, uh, Dark Secrets of the New Age. I think that was it. Dark, the, se dark Secrets. Dark of, Secrets of the New Age. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was it. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the one I have. Yeah, I think I have that one too. I'll have to go back and look at it. But that, that, what year did that come out? Well, I think that might have been right around the time. I think he too was inspired by by Constance. By Constance, Cundy. yeah. So it was early '80s. Yeah, because she kind of, with her being so out there in the public, yes, I think she, then other people started doing the research and talking about things. So yeah, it was it was a good time for uh, information to come out, even though they didn't have what we have today as far as to, to uh, be able to get the information out to the masses. Of course, I'm not getting the information out to the masses. I get the information out to a few thousand people, but mm -hmm. not like a million people. Well, and Connie was really good at analyzing things, being a lawyer. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and she was very big on documentation. And so yeah, yeah, she research. had all the footnotes, but... People felt like she went too far. I, I was, you know, kind of her defender with, with you know, CRI with Walter Martin. Well, it was information overload at the time. It's like, oh, no, all this stuff can't be going on because it's too bizarre. Well, you her problem was, her problem as far as CRI felt is she was just bringing too many people into it. It was the same criticism they had on Dave Hunt, that if a person, um, you know, had a, had a rainbow in the back of their car or something, that meant they were absolutely a new ager and things like that. That's where some of the paranoia came in. In fact, she thought Walter Martin was trying to hypnotize her when my sister, who was his producer and well secretary then became his producer when we arranged to have the two of them come together and talk over these things she claimed he was trying to hypnotize her while they were talking oh no i think i think she did she did go overboard on the rainbow thing because i liked <laughs> rainbows at the time i think i even had a rainbow sticker on my dryer at home uh -oh. but I, but you're, you're no, part of the conspiracy yeah so I didn't make a big deal about rainbows because God did put a rainbow in the sky That's to right. say there wasn't going to be any f more floods. So, yeah, I I didn't I didn't buy all that, but no. But she sure she sure nailed the you know the the some of the organizations and uh, you know within the New Age movement and of course Marilyn Ferguson who wrote oh yeah she talked Conspiracy. about her a lot. So what was the name again of Constance's book? Oh, well, I mean, the second one? Rainbow, what, two? Oh, well, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow was her first book, and the second one was called A Planned Deception. Okay. But A Planned Deception did show where she was getting paranoid about everything, oh. more so than the original book. And that's because I think the original book, uh, Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, Huntington House, who does in that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, that was the publisher. House, yeah. So she, it was professionally edited and produced, but the a planned deception was self um, was a, was a, was a self published thing. Oh, they just, didn't want that one. Yeah, uh, and it didn't work out too well. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, you got to give her kudos for for blowing the whistle. Oh, on absolutely. It. Yeah, she she was right on about so many things, and she was way ahead of her time. Yeah. Then, because there wasn't that many people doing that kind of thing and it and it was kind of dangerous because the the uh heretics and the hypocrites they were oh wow they were all up in arms that you would dare name names and mm. talk about just like the secret service christian stephen strang and mario marillo where they were unmasking traitors in the church but yet they would tell you who they were <laughs> no, well, no, and not only that, they'd go out, go after the low-hanging fruit. I mean, you know, Cat Carr with her purple hair, you know, and the and who was the ones that are going to heaven and playing ping pong with Jesus or whatever. Yeah, you know, they're kind of easy to 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 refute, right? Yeah. But it's 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 some of the more subtle deceptions that Dave Hunt really did a good job in the seduction of Christianity of pointing out these more subtle seductions. And I, I think, and we've talked about this before, about how the uh, so-called um, 
biblical principles that people have determined uh, that they they that miracles. There's a law to miracles. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And and what was that? Um, oh, there's the pr- law of prosperity. Oh there's- yeah, there was laws of prosperity yeah, that you must keep. After I got delivered from the New Age movement, I didn't keep any of those laws of prosperity. I realized that I could seek first the kingdom of God and all the other things would be added unto me. Yeah. <laughs> so that became my law of prosperity. Yeah, and, and these things that both uh, that, that are really big in the New Age movement was the occult idea of visualizing something and creating your own reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you had people like well, Richard Roberts and a whole lot of the Pentecostal sort of charismaniacs who would who would say, we call the things that are not as though they were. Well, only God can do that. And when you look up that passage, it I, I, I can't remember. I think it's in Job. It's, re, it's God talking. You don't create reality. So, so this stuff crept in really bad. Yeah. And now nobody seems to even give a hoot about it anymore in the church. And now it's, it's just part of the rhetoric. Yeah, it's part of the rhetoric. Well, I wanted to touch on this too, because we had talked about it, about the whole naming names and going to your brother before you go public with calling out a wolf. So what, what does that all mean? Jack? Well, yeah. Um, what is it? The Matthew 18 uh, passage that, that's yeah. the big one they like to use yeah and there's also i think first corinthians 6 or something not taking a brother to court or whatever but if it's uh, a brother you know the really thing is is that if you've got and, and dave has had to dave hunt has had to talk defend himself throughout his whole ministry that if you have a public ministry then that is the forum that they chose so you challenge them in the forum that they are in if they come to you privately and say something, then you deal with them privately. But if they are public, you better go public. You better have as wide an audience as the person giving the heresy has so that it can be refuted that, you know, the same people who were fooled would not be fooled anymore. It's the whole point of it is to warn people so they aren't stumbled. Yeah. And their faith isn't shipwrecked. Yeah. Yeah, So, so, uh, as far as the, uh, well, you should go to your brother. And so you, how do you go to any of these people? You can't call them on the phone because they won't take your phone call. I yeah. called Charisma Magazine several times, and I get some little old lady on the phone that's uh, probably working from home, and she's just taking phone calls because you tell her, can I please talk to somebody there about an issue? And she said, well, what is it? What do you? And I know I'm wasting my time talking to her because she's in La La Land somewhere. She doesn't even know what you're talking about. Well, and, she's probably a volunteer. Yeah, 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 right. And uh, so I tell her, and she said, well, I'll see if I could get a message to somebody. So nobody talks to you. Like, who's Susan Puzio? We don't care about her. Like, uh, well, if Benny Hinn calls or Paul... Uh, Matt Crouch or somebody, sure, they're going to take the call. Well, they have the right numbers. So who do you call? You Even if you email them, they don't answer you. Even if you put a comment on some of their articles, they don't answer you. So how do you talk to these people? Once in a while, I, I'll make a comment on YouTube, on somebody's channel or on Twitter. Once in a, in a, in a blue moon, somebody will answer me. I'm, and I'm asking the question like I asked on... Uh, well, Steve. sometimes the door opens for you to talk to these people. I had a back and forth email debate, oh, at least 10 years ago. Oh, well, hell, it was even longer than that, come to think of it. It was more like maybe 15 years ago. And I and I had it out with Lance Wall now. Yeah, well, at least I don't think he, I don't think he would do that now. No, probably not now. Now, and he was he was courteous, I will say, and I, I but he wouldn't agree with me, of course. And it's been so long now. I and, and not only that, it's on an old computer. I don't even have a hard drive anymore, so I couldn't even because I wanted to find it, and it was in an using old no email account that I don't even think exists anymore. You know that that particular server. Yeah. But 
Some will. I've I've had face-to-face confrontations with several of these big names, such as James Robeson, and um, who, anyway, I don't get off into that story, but it was, I was doing this for Dave Hunt. He had asked me to talk to him and to approach him about what he thought of the seduction of Christianity. And, and you know, his answer when, when I did get to approach him, he, he said, well, I agree with almost everything that Dave wrote, except not naming names. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, how do you <laughs> warn somebody about a wolf? Paul said, I cease not to warn you with night and day with tears. So yeah. what was he doing? What was he warning about? Yeah, like, I know. And he was naming names because he talked about what high Miletus and yeah, yeah. Know, so where yeah, do they get this harm. stuff from? They're just trying to protect. They try to protect each other. These politicians, yes. they're religious politicians, and they'll use scriptures such as, um, "Oh, what's that about about high sins or something?" Oh, they have different ones about how you should hide your the, the sin. And you're doing them a favor. Um, <laughs> but you know what? There's also those who say you know, that the Bible talks about those who shipwreck others' faith. Yeah. So what do you do with that? Yeah, what do you do with that? That's it. You have to take everything in context. You just can't pull one scripture out of, out of context and then run with it. They make a doctrine. But the most of these professional uh, religious politicians, they're interested in their bank accounts, how much, how many invitations they could get, how many television appearances they could make, how many books they could sell. So they're not going to rock the boat. And that's the way it is. And that's the same problem in the publishing, Christian publishing. You know, I, I know when my husband wrote the book on, because um, it's called Heaven Can't Wait, about these near-death experiences and also this heaven and hell hopping going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, he did a whole chapter on what was her name, Betty Eady, or something like that, and they took that. And, and so Harvest, no, it wasn't Harvest House. It was um, it was uh, well, Baker Book. Betty Baxter too had one of those. He, well, I think I think this one was Betty Eady. But anyway, okay. they they, remo- they they he 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 gave them the manuscript and they took that entire chapter out and said we can't have that chapter because we publish her books. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. And yeah. that's what was happening. The the Christian publishing houses were being sold off to secular people. And yeah. so they didn't care about doctrine. What do they care? We just want to sell books. So, yeah, everything started to get so corrupt. And well, it becomes business. When, yeah. when, when Christianity becomes big business, they go by business principles, not the Bible. Yeah, and that's what happened. And then... Of course, the churches did the same thing. They went, started businesses, mm-hmm. and the pastor was the CEO, and he was the wor- he was the very well pay is the very well paid CEO. Just like this church in my neighborhood here, they had Jesse Duplantis here. Well, this isn't a real big county. There might be two hundred thousand or more people in this county. Oh. Well, how do you afford to bring Jesse Duplantis here? He flew in on his private jet oh boy. and flew out the same night. So how do you afford that? That's at least $50,000 because you have to pay for his jet fuel and his pilot, and you have to give him a nice offering. And then next week, they're having Rod Parsley over there. Oh, boy. So you And this church is not that old. It's own, it's not, it hasn't been here that long. And... They're bringing in these big names, and well, yeah, because they want to draw a crowd. Yeah, they want to draw a crowd. They also want to rub shoulders because these people aren't going to pay any attention to this pastor and his wife. They don't know them from Adam. But if you invite them, then they they're looking for those political uh, political connections. Yes, and the ones that are trying to make political alliances really get into compromise because the especially when they enter into prayer or you know ministry side with those that they are politically aligned with and uh, of course you know a perfect example of that is 
all of the mighty men of, of Donald Trump's and then running off to bow before Reverend Mrs. Moon. Uh, yeah, they just yeah, don't figure care. that one out, right? How could anybody see that and think it's okay or it doesn't really matter that Donald Trump, Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, who's such a phony, mm-hmm. and and uh, Paula White and Newt Gingrich, they all go running to Mrs. Moon for money. Mm-hmm. That is disgusting. It's Well, Jar- Jerry Falwell did that with uh, her late husband. Yeah, he did. So did uh, Bush Sr. take millions of dollars, according to Moon's ex-daughter-in-law, that mm-hmm. she, no- she put it in her book that uh, they were taking millions. So how many, they they do it for money. You go to some cult leader that says she's God, and then you want to come and court us? No. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. wasn't, isn't she supposed to be the Holy Spirit? Well, she is, but she's also supposed to be married to Jesus. Oh yeah, and she's gotten daughter of God. She's the only begotten, (laughs) yeah, she says she, She's so, the only yeah, begotten it, it, daughter of God because Jesus failed in his mission. So her and her husband have to finish what Jesus started and bring heaven right, to earth. Yeah. They're building some yeah, kind yeah. of like billion dollar building there in Korea. Boy. Yeah, and they're supposed to open it, I think, in March or May. So expect probably expect all of these reprobates to be there for this opening they'd have to be reprobate or just you know again never never knew the lord in the first place no, which is more never, likely they never knew the lord nobody can go like uh paula white get up and say mrs moon loves the lord when she thinks she is the lord <laughs> yeah yeah or at least his daughter yeah well, i don't know i guess the holy spirit is the lord too so well, yeah if she's the only begotten daughter she is she is yeah, the lord. right yeah yeah, she's deity. Yeah, she's so. deity. So, and she said it right in front of her. She had the same green jacket on when she was saying it. She got Mrs. Moon got up and said, "I'm the only begotten daughter of God." She said it, mm. and then Paula comes up with a with a bouquet of flowers and bows down to her. So, it's not like she didn't hear it. Yeah, and then all kinds of people would go to these meetings that where Paula would have and when when President Trump was in office and she would have these gatherings. I remember one particular one in Las Vegas with they all came to and she led it and Pastor Jack Hibbs of Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills was there and and talking about what a wonderful time they all had when she was the one leading the prayers. Yeah. How did these men do that? Yeah, good question. Because, you know, when, when we are are servants of the most high God, we put, we're supposed to put his interests at the top of anything. Our interests don't matter. Nobody else's interests matter except his. And, and he doesn't want us gallivanting around with antichrist. I don't know. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And then to make it look like, so what, that Mm -hmm. we're there, and uh, then Trump's going to come around now that he's r- running again, and he's going to try to court us? No. No, it's not going to work this time. I, a lot of people aren't rallying behind him, but we'll see. I want to see how many of these men have a backbone and are going to go following around Jezebel, Paula, <laughs> and Trump, the compromiser that goes to Antichrist for money. Yeah. Uh- and why? Because of the cares of this world, they're bogged down with the cares of this world. And what happens when Jesus comes and he, and, he, and he calls them to the banquet? The other one is so caught up in the cares of this world, they're not, they, they don't want to go with him. You know, well, wait till I do this and that. Wait till, wait till I go to Paula's meeting and then I'll come, you know, or whatever. Or we'll go to a Trump rally. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I got a Trump rally today, Lord. Come tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, how deceived. I left a comment on uh, Steve Strang. YouTube channel when they did this unmasking traitors in the church and then they wouldn't unmask anybody. So uh, I left a comment. I, I said, uh, Steve, uh, Mario, would you please let me know how you th- what your opinion is of Paula White 
bowing down to Mrs. Moon, and I left a link to my video and calling her a Christian. Well, I, they never answered me. I, yeah, I would like an answer. Uh, if you ever listen to this, Mario or Steve or anybody that knows them, would you please ask them that question? I'd like to know, how could you support, after you know that, how could you support any of these people? Yeah, and but yet, you know, we can warn and warn and warn, but it doesn't mean they're going to pay heed. I mean, look at what's going on with this Asbury Seminary uh, and with this who knows, you know, revival or what, but that they would allow and bring in Todd Bentley. They didn't allow people. it. He went there on his own. Okay, but no, I they didn't bring him of, in. They didn't uh, want him there. He, oh, he they went, didn't? Oh, well, no. that's good. No, they didn't let him minister he but was he there sure to himself well yeah, he wanted to get in on it i guess he figured they were stupid yeah well i hope they're not i sent them a video of him no. doing his antics and sent them an article i wrote i never heard back from them no they didn't have anything to do with him as far as i know from what i read today is that he was there <laughs> he posted on twitter he was there in the crowd but he was leaving. He said, oh, it was so wonderful. No, he wasn't invited. They didn't want him there. I, well, I've, I've heard that all kinds of NAR people are, you know, getting trying to, I don't know if they're invited or just imposing they're themselves not, I don't, on it. They're not inviting anybody. As far, the, the interview that I heard, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, but as far as I know, when I listened to this young girl on Tucker the other night, the president of the student body, very nice young girl, obviously loves the Lord. Yeah. And uh, then I listened to her again today on Glenn Beck. And I think yeah. I have that clip. I think I can play that clip if you want okay. to. Okay, sure. And uh, no, it, nobody's preaching. It's a prayer meeting. So they weren't, they're not inviting anybody there. Let me play No, but this. opportunists will try to get Yeah, in. well, of course, Todd Bentley's, he doesn't have a platform anymore, so of course he wants to make it like, oh, look, I'm going. Here it is. By three, it says, the Lord is the great God oh, no, and the great king the above all gods. Right, we're like a hundred mm -hmm. crippled people, mm -hmm. not one. Wait a it's been a bizarre week. It started with the president and the Pentagon going, I don't know, maybe those, were, those balloons were aliens. What? I'm going to give you some shocking news. There is a college in Kentucky that has a weekly chapel service. I know, right? I know, that's weird enough, but it goes further than that. On February 8th, there was a morning service, and there was an altar call. Just come on down if you want to get prayed on. And there was just a couple dozen students there that they were gathering. It's been going on now since February 8th, 24 hours a day, and people are coming from all over the country. It's miraculous. Allison Perfader is with us now. She is with um, the, she's actually the student body president at Ashbury University. Hello, uh, uh, Allison. How are you? Ah, good morning. How are you? I'm, I'm good. Thank you for having me on. I think this is, I mean, this uh, almost brings tears to my eyes. This is such a miraculous thing that's going on. Tell yeah, us about yeah. it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like you said, it's miraculous. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of Wilmore, Kentucky, but we have one street <laughs> and we call it downtown. <laughs> and so when the whole world is watching us, you have to wonder what is God doing here? Because there's nothing about here that people want to see. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so this started on February 8th. It wasn't planned, right? It just... Correct. <laughs> just started and then how how did other people i mean that's a small town how how, how did it go on for even just the first 24 hours what was yeah, happening really, yeah um it's like you said uh february 8th we had our our regular chapel and then uh a couple students didn't leave and then a couple students heard that a couple students didn't leave and then um president brown came over and i came over to see what was happening and and, and I, I, I can just say that Holy Spirit was, was so present there, you could almost see it. And we were just going, wow, what is going on? And then our surrounding communities heard about it. And obviously social media played a huge role in, in spreading the word. And we've had friends now from Brazil and Indonesia. And, I mean, everybody, everybody wants in on it. <laughs> I had to tell you, I want to take my family. Um, this is... Yes. 
this is um, this is something that I I really respect um, the fact that you didn't push this out on social media. You you are you're not hyping this. You're kind of a reluctant group to make a big deal out of this because you say it's a it's really a sacred thing that just is happening organically and you don't want it to be a circus. Right. right? Yeah, and especially because I think something that Asbury and a lot of universities and honestly just my generation struggles with is is pride. And what we've seen here is just such a radical humility that students are standing up and, and confessing things that have been done to them or that they've done, and, and they're opening their hearts up to not only the presence of God but to each other. And that is a very intimate thing. And so there are some mixed feelings about it, it becoming global. And it's obviously amazing and it's great, but but there is that that core of honesty that, that we're still holding on to. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, but there's one thing that she said that raises a red flag. What's that? She, do, did you catch it when she said, referred to Holy Spirit instead of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, that, that, that does bother me. And in fact, because there's others who are re- saying out there, and again, it's on social media, and I don't know what their documentation is on any of this, but there's some that are saying that at that college that there was a lot of new age, uh, not new age, excuse me, new the, the NAR people that were there, and that it might have been something that was, um, you know, influenced by some of those students. And so, but you see, I always say if there's any there, that are seeking the truth, then the truth should be uh, supplied for them. And that's what disturbs me that others will say, oh, look at who's going and this is terrible. Well, who is t- taking information there that could help them? Like, I, I mean, it made me bring up what we did years ago, and this was in Los Angeles, and it was it was the last meeting of the crazy tattooed goon we were just referring to, you know, Todd. Yeah, Todd Bentley. Bentley and and I put a tr- I put an information sheet together and drove down I was living in Northern California at that time and and my sister who was living in Orange County we all met up and handed out these information sheets to the people that were going to this big rally that he was having in LA and this was his last rally before he was exposed okay as the pervert that he is yeah and um old people were really angry and, you know, ripping up the track and throwing it back at us. And I was just supplying all the information about, you know, his background and all of that. And, uh, this, this one young man who resembled the, uh, musician Prince, he came by and I handed him a track and he stood there and reading it and started going, wow, wow, wow. Oh, he's so glad you guys are here. My friends are all, or I'll come into this thing and I know there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. So anyway, I brought up, I put on, on Facebook a picture of that track and I tagged this man, this young man, because we end up becoming friends. His name is Brandon. I tagged Brandon and he said, yeah, I went in there and I was the only one in there that was screaming, Hey, blasphemy <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> He made me laugh so much. And he said he, he, he took, cause I know he took a stack of our tracks in there and he said he did bail out some of his friends and then somebody else. And then they had given it to somebody else, somebody's mom or something that then saw through it. So I was really happy to hear that. Cause I, he says, he thinks he, 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 he went to one of my women on the watch conferences and I remember he and his wife came and I remember talking to them at that conference, but he says he thinks he told me about it then, but I don't recall. And so I'm just happy to hear that something that we did did have an impact. Well, you know, I'm not in any position at, at my, I don't even have a group of people like I did back then to gather to respond to such things. But whoever's in Kentucky, if there's decent churches there, why aren't they running over there and trying to help those who are seeking the Lord and giving them the proper information or I don't know what's happening. I, I don't have enough information. I know I, when I saw her on Tucker, her name was Allison, I think she was so sincere and 
Yeah. And seems genuine to me. So I don't really know. Well, I can't, I can't who, talk who, about it. Yes. Someone else who visited said that, that she, when she was there, there was just a few students in there and they were praying with each other. Yeah. And it just looked at, you know, looked normal. It looked normal. Yeah. And then I it just, think, people yeah, stayed I, around. But I think those that are infiltrating aren't getting it, getting the stuff stirred up. I guess well, not there going might for be it. infiltration and in that so that's what we have to look at then as we examine it but I think they were sincere it seemed to me sincere when they started and they were sincerely crying out to God and repenting of their sins and that's how it started so what happens now with you know we'll see what happens but yeah I know when I first heard about it I shared it on Facebook and said it was very encouraging to yeah, see that to see the young people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I want the young people yeah, to, to, to be saved and to have discernment and to get in the word. That was, that, that's wonderful news. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. But we have to look at, I, I haven't examined the videos yet. I haven't looked at, uh, but, but I saw this thing today from Todd Bentley on Twitter. He was there, but he wasn't participating. They didn't invite him there. Okay. So, no, he, because it, she said they don't have speakers, really. It's just mainly prayer. So, anyway, here's, here's Todd Bentley. In case you haven't heard this guy, he, he, kicking people. As he's, this is his Paper, like a hundred crippled people, not one. He said, that's because I want you to grab that lady's crippled legs and bang them up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. <laughs> I walked up and I grabbed her legs and I started going, be healed, be healed. I started banging them up and down on the platform. She got healed. And I'm thinking, God, why is not the power of God moving? He said, because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. <laughs> and there's this older lady worshiping right in front of the platform. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face with your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. Bam! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. And I saw him and the gift of faith came on me. I said, what do I do, God? And God told me to just run him down. So I jumped up in the air and I went, bam! And I hit him to the ground, jumped onto him, and got into a full mount. Ground and pound. I jumped on That's Todd Bentley. Yes, and, and, and if people aren't aware of what I was referencing as far as this the immoral scandal, he uh, dropped his wife who, oh, they had several children yeah. and everything, and, and then he, he started, you know, then he ended up with, or he left her for this younger model yeah. uh, who was one of his assistants yeah. in the ministry, yeah. And, and then there was there was report later that you know supposedly he he was restored and then he went back into wife swapping with with you know all this kind of stuff so I mean and Rick Joyner one of the original Kansas City prophets slash false prophets yeah he was supposed to be the one restoring Todd yeah, Bentley yeah and, sure yeah yeah, yeah I mean it, it's just this whole there's always you know from the Kansas City prophets to the NAR. These guys have a history of immorality all the way through where, you know, their prophets either had homosexual flings or were messing around with, with uh, you know, the younger women, of course. You know, they're not going to go after some uh, lady their own age, you know, well, or size. Yeah, well, yeah. And <laughs> the other day in the Charisma, they had... Uh, Bob Jones' prophecy about the Super Bowl comes to pass, yeah. something like that. I'm like, yeah. what is Bob Jones? He was he was molesting women in his office. That's right. And he was saying that they had to please him because he's the prophet. Yeah, and how could anybody take the, these people seriously? How could you take Bob Jones seriously after that? How could you take Todd Bentley seriously after that? He was kicking people and punching people and mounting people and... And, people, and the people there in the church were laughing, like, that's funny. Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting because when, with the Kansas City prophets, of course, they just kind of reestablished themselves after they went undercover for a while uh, because of, you know, as you mentioned, Bob Jones 
not to be confused with Bob Jones University, by the way, yeah, but the, right. the false prophet Bob Jones had that incident. And then, of course, Paul Kane had the homosexual incident. And then after that, supposedly they were being overseen at that time by the late John Wimber, the head of the, the vineyard movement. And they were supposed to be under his his control. And he totally washed his hands when it got that crazy with not only them, but then when when the whole thing moved into uh, Toronto and some of this stuff that, you know, that got too crazy. And so Wimber, I uh, always said, you know, he created this monster by giving them, oh, the, the theological backing for making prophecy only have to be 50% correct and not 100%, you yeah. know, things like that. And and so, so he... He disavows himself of it. In fact, I have all the paperwork of him disavowing himself in my file oh. over here. Uh, but he never he never straightened things out or um, corrected anybody or anything like that. It was all done behind the scenes. And oh, I think his name was Todd Hunter or something. His second in command contacted me at the time, and uh, this is before they that he did the disavowal, and uh, because we had been writing about this and you know, in our Christian Sentinel and everything. Well, and, did he um, know you were writing about it? Yeah, yeah, because he contacted me. Oh. And, um, and wanted my, he wanted my take on how Calvary Chapel people might look at this whole holy laughter stuff. And I gave him, you know, what, what I was hearing in, in those circles. And, and I gave him all the, the scriptures and everything. And it's interesting because he must have been taking notes and we must have talked for over an hour because when that paper came out, all the scriptures that I gave him was all in that paper. Yeah. And that's good, you know, so, okay. So, so Wimber did back off, you know, when it got out of his control, but he created the monster and then it just went on and got worse even then. And, uh, you know, I didn't see him getting on Christian television apologizing. No, I for. didn't see that either because he no, was still on TBN. Yeah. Even after you say he disavowed, he was still right. divided in those circles. That's right. And he, he never apologized to the body of Christ, no. which is what he, in, in, you know, in, inflicted all of this upon the whole body, uh, you know, given them his seal of approval. And in his magazine, Equipping the Saints, which I have all those copies of, where he's, you know, got articles in, in his magazine by, by all those guys, by Paul Kane and, and the rest of them. Yeah. And all, you know, all defending the the defending most of it until it got into the you know seducing the, the ladies that 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 didn't sit well with him. Yeah, well, I I guess it shouldn't sit well with him. Uh, no, it shouldn't sit well with him because it, it, when that happens, no, these guys don't belong in any kind of ministry position. They can't be trusted. Uh, I'm not saying God can't forgive them if they truly repent. But they should just go away and be quiet. Take a secular job and leave people alone. Because we don't need these kind of perverts in the ministry. It, it's so disgraceful when you think about it. Because people come to church or they go to meetings because they want help. They're hurting. And then to have these people take advantage of them the way they do, it's, it's really horrible. But let's, let's just talk about... Um, this, you, you gave me this Lonnie Frisbee audio, but I know we're probably going to do a whole program on this new movie. But anyway, let me play this. Mm -hmm. Sometime in 1967, at the age of 17, Lonnie Frisbee took another trip into Takeets Canyon. There he took a hit of LSD, removed his clothing, and began to pray in a relatively unorthodox but sincere manner. When the Lord called me, I, went, I was going into the desert and I was taking all my clothes off and I'm going, God, if you're really real, reveal yourself to me. And one afternoon, the whole atmosphere of this canyon that I was in started to tingle and get light and it started to change and I'm just going, uh-oh, I didn't want to be there. He would later recount that it was here that God came to him in a vision and told him of the unique role that he was soon to play. It thrills my soul to see all the kids coming and following after Jesus. I kind of relate to John the Baptist down in the wilderness, baptizing in the River Jordan sometimes. It's really neat to see how each one reacts in a different way, but I can feel the presence of God coming down 
upon me and upon the person being baptized and just all over the place. And I, I immediately started to grow my hair a little bit longer than it was, so I, I really looked like Isaiah's grandson. <laughs> I wore St. Francis of Assisi shirts with hoods on them and wore robes and things like that. The people tell me that I'm trying to look like Jesus. I can't think of anybody else I'd rather look like. <laughs> yeah, so what does Jesus look like? Nobody knows. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's interesting that, that he would mention Francis of Assisi, who yeah. was a Western <laughs> mystic. Yeah. And, um, and see, a lot of the Catholicism kind of laid a lot of the foundation for where things really got off when they started uh, getting into the, you know, the, the, the people. Oh, well, you know, he started the, wearing a priest collar. Oh, yeah, yeah, the priest collars. But really the mysticism, the, the, they supposedly were Western mystics instead of Eastern mystics, but a mystic's a mystic, and they're trying to seek some, some principles or things that they can do to get a spiritual experience. It, it, you know, they, they can't wait on God. They have to, you know, conjure it up themselves. And yeah, but so, how did he get away with it for so long, this guy? Every, they, he was accepted. Now, the background is they're making a movie or they're releasing a movie about Lonnie Wright and Chuck Smith. Yeah, and Chuck, it's supposed to be about Chuck, of course, Lonnie playing a big role. And Lonnie was there in the beginning. Well, when the hippie, with, with the hippies all coming in, he certainly was part was of that. was in the 70s? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, late I, well, Late 70s. I guess early, no, early 70s, oh. around 1970, actually. Oh. And, you know, I wasn't there. I mean, I was I was in the neighborhood and I wasn't yeah, safe. Well, no, <laughs> but I had a, you know, my very best friend who's still my, the, you know, she's like a sister to me. We've known, e we've known each other since kindergarten. But anyway, she was part of it when, uh, in 1970, 71, when she was, you know, in her se our senior year of high school. And, uh and so, yeah, it, it, so there, it was a real outpouring of God. This is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This had nothing to do with Lonnie, and it had nothing to do with anything that Chuck manipulated. This was God pouring out his spirit in the late 60s, early 70s, throughout, throughout the West Coast, really. And, um, you know, I've had some friends who, who were part of the coffeehouse ministries up like in Hay yeah, Ashbury. Yeah, that was big coffeehouse. Uh, right? Doug Krieger. I don't know if you know him by name. Yeah, he was I know one. Who he is. Yeah. yeah, he ran one of them. So did Ed, Ed Plowman, who used to be the PR director for uh, the Billy Graham Association, who was a friend of mine and my husband's. Uh, he also uh, had his own coffeehouse thing. So yeah. this was going on before before it reached Chuck. And, and I'm sure that some of the hippies, you know, influenced Lonnie, you know, because they were all up, up and down 101. <laughs> we had this, the whole, the whole highway 101 between LA and, and San Francisco back in the day. In fact, in the, it was 1970 that my friend Peggy and I were hitchhiking up and down all that. I wish I would have ran into some of these hippies myself at the time, because I guess <laughs> you're going to use some help. I know. And we don't talk about that part of my past, do we? <laughs> no, but that's the thing. I, 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 I know I didn't get saved till 1981, but I met, I met some people that knew the Lord, but they never told me. Yes, yeah, same here. My, my best friend, Linda, she would, you know, she would tell me some things that sounded real creepy, like, oh, oh, at the hint, tent meeting, they're speaking in tongues and people are interpreting what they're saying. I go, what do you mean speaking in tongues? What does that mean? Well, she says they're talking in a language that they don't know. And I said, okay, Linda, that is creepy. And, you know, and so I, she, so I would talk to her and say, she goes, well, what are you doing? And I, I'd say, you know, I went to, I went to a party and really had a rad time, you know, and she goes, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> Yeah, so if that's she's it. Listening, then, sorry, Linda, I yeah, love you. You know it, that. <laughs> it took me, I think, uh, 1980 when finally an evangelist did tell me face to face that I was messed up. I'm like, I messed up. You're messed up. Don't tell me I'm messed up. They use you that spirit of rebellion. But anyway, it took a long time. But so they're making this movie now. Is the movie mm. finished? This, uh, what's the name of this movie? It's called Jesus Revolution. And. Um, 
uh, Kelsey Grammer plays the part of Chuck Smith, and it's not a very, from the trailer, it doesn't look very convincingly no, like I, Chuck I, Smith. No, he didn't, I didn't like it at all. I thought he was miscast. Anyway, or who's producing that? Did you say Greg Laurie had something to do with it? Uh, yeah, Greg Laurie did have something to do with it. And, oh, I don't know the the, the name of the actual director or anything like that. Because they're yeah, doing would... a, st- a stupid job the way I, I saw in the trailer. I didn't like the way they were portraying Chuck in the trailer. No, no. Well, and, and I know, well, again, who can play Chuck Smith? Nobody can play Chuck Smith. Well, there has, and, there's, there's uh, I, I knew Chuck Smith. It reminds, reminds me, what was that line, that one political thing? Uh, like, I knew John Kennedy, and you're no John Kennedy. Wasn't yeah. that? Remember that? Yeah, remember and I'm that. saying, well, I knew Chuck Smith, and you're no Chuck Smith. <laughs> yeah, well, the actors can be convincing. They can, yeah, yeah, but not the, I, the, I guess it's whoever wrote the script or who the producer is, because I was not impressed with the trailer. I thought they made Chuck look stupid. At one point, and well, it's just yeah, and, me and I got a, a comment because I posted some, you know, that Lonnie thing you just played on my Facebook page, and I heard from somebody who were friends with the Smiths, you know, since childhood, and she was re- said something about that. The uh, trailer we were just referring to, this Jesus Revolution, that didn't sit right with her. She says they've shown clips from the, you know, these clips. She says so much of it is a fabrication. It's not even funny, and yeah. it's very, very, very sad. I especially take issue of Kelsey that he keeps repeating the phrase Chuck Smith was a man who needed to find his face, and supposedly he found it through Lonnie. Uh, yeah, well, that's also, ridiculous. they mentioned that he was worried about getting fired and that the church was small. That was an absolute lie. I was there. The church had been growing on the little church on the on Church Street. You can still drive by and see it. From him teaching the word, it had grown and grown. In other words, they they're lying when they say that that Chuck was you know trying to find some solution to losing you know, have a, having a failing church, and then like she says, that's a full blown lie. And and of course. I didn't even, I had never heard of that because Chuck Smith didn't create the revival. The revival was happening and he became receptive and teaching and and just focusing on teaching these young people the word. And he didn't care how they showed up with no shoes or whatever. There was no dress code. Um, and, And God was using him every step of the way he had, he, he was just obedient yeah, no. So why can't they just tell the truth? Why do they have to make things up when they do these movies? Just tell the truth. The story is good enough on its own. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't know how uh, how this. Like you said, you'll probably go to see it if uh, we decide we're going to do this program or if we can get the guest or whatever. So yeah. it, it'll be yeah. interesting because it. To me, this Lonnie Frisbee was a very strange character. I don't know how he got away with the things he got away with when he, he even his t- even the testimony at first was strange to me, this clip that we just played. Yeah. Well, because uh, John Wimber and, was involved with, with uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa also. And then he ended up leaving. And I'm not sure, I think, I think Chuck, you know, I know they parted ways because Wimber supposedly wanted to focus more on signs and wonders rather than the word. Yeah. And so they, they parted ways, however it happened. And then Lonnie joined up with, with um, Wimber and then, you know, he started having the manifestations, the shaking, the, the, oh, yeah, the spirit, yeah, yeah. and all the crazy manifestations. And, you know, he's the one that came up with the, with the, with the uh, chant, more Lord, more Lord, you know, and oh, all yeah, this, where, yeah, that... where this is really where the unclean spirit took hold. And we are seeing that. It, it's been handed down, and we see that today in the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation, with these current false prophets and the ones who are trying to get these revival goings, going, and and they came from that stream, and it, it's it's a dirty, rotten stream. Yeah. And um, and so, you know, Lonnie had free reign because of Wimber, because Wimber wanted to ch- chase. In fact, he had a t- he had a TV sh- his own program on TBN, and it was called Signs and Wonders because that's what he wanted to follow. 
John and if, Wimbo, and right? he'd make them happen. You know, he, he, he was from, he, he originally, he was a Quaker. He, you know, the friends. Oh church. yeah. They quake. Yeah. And so they had to do all that quaking. Yeah. And so but <laughs> at, at the same time, he was, um, you know, he was really involved in, you know, this inner, inner looking inward type of stuff. And so that's, has you know has devolved i guess over over the the decades and so well that's what happens when the word of god isn't enough like, that should be right. enough like right so yeah they got carried away and then they got carried away with their own importance and all that and and uh, being famous and and uh anyway he didn't have a good end john wimber it was a tragic uh he had what brain cancer or something so he had a charge again then later well he did have cancer but he died of heart failure from what i understand oh and i have the tape of him talking about his illness on tbn yeah, yeah. Because it was it was really horrible wow. yeah in fact i have that on my um youtube uh, it, there's a picture of wimber on and, and i have, have that clip oh, okay. where he talks about catching uh uh he was in hong kong and he caught a demon and the demon gave him the cancer. Oh wow! Yeah, the cancer demon, and he couldn't get rid of that one. Yeah, he. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's it's uh, it's sad, and you know, I've been writing about this for decades, and of course, in my book, The Fleecing of Christianity, I do delve into that side of things also, and. Uh, so they can read your book on it's your sad Christian because- Sentinel for. Free. Yeah, it's online. Yeah, yeah. at christiansentinel.com that you can see the full PDF of because it's, you know, now it's, I don't know how old that is, 15, 20 years old now. So uh, it's a whole different story today, but it's it's gotten worse in a lot of ways. And there's even less emphasis on the word of God today than there than there yeah, was yeah. during the really That's big signs and wonders movement. Even with all it's this, worse today. Yeah. No, they, it's these these the most popular churches are just motivational speakers yeah. throwing that one scripture out and then you know and then setting their Bible down and carrying on. That's it. That's it. It, it, it. Even with all the communication we have, oh, radio, television, internet, you would think, wow, there would be a word explosion, but no, it's a, it's the great apostasy that we're seeing. And uh, of course, God does have a remnant. Yes. They like to use that phrase to the false prophets and the false apostles. They like to talk about the remnant. But God does have a remnant, and we're not going to compromise. We're going to stand strong for Jesus Christ because we can never forget what he's done for us. But anyway, that's our program for today. Jackie, thanks so much. How can people get in touch with you? Well, find me on Facebook at Jackie Alnor and send me a friend request. But if you just opened up your account, you might have a hard time. You might have to privately message me and say, hey, I just opened this because these new ones I don't even accept, <laughs> you know, some of these things. Uh, or and look at ChristianSentinel.com and sign up for my monthly newsletter and uh, and read my that book. And then you could also go to Amazon and read my book that uh, oh, it's not quite a year old called The United States of Israel in the uh, that's kind of a controversial book, and it's, uh, you know, people don't want to talk about those things, but well, I talk about it. Well, everybody's got a different opinion on things, and so it's it, it's not going to send anybody to hell just because you have a different opinion on things. <laughs> and we should be able to discuss differences, and maybe people can learn something. Maybe uh, they might not agree with you. I don't agree. We don't agree on everything 100%. We have different, but we're still friends. I'm not going to discount you as my friend because I don't agree with you on some things. Maybe I could learn something. I don't know everything either. So maybe people can learn something that's a little bit different and then have a discussion about it. Oh, no so, one wants to discuss it. It's, oh, yeah, because it's, it's... No, don't talk they don't about. even want to discuss it, and that's because they don't have an alternative explanation. If they had an alternative explanation, they could defend it, but they don't have one. And so that's the sad thing about it. But you'd have to, re- you know, read it. Well, that's but anyway, it. People it have nice to, read to be it. with you. Yeah, and get, Again, get their Susan. own, uh, draw their own conclusion, and then contact you and and oh i wish i haven't gotten any opposition at all and the ones who tried it's it's pathetic they do not have an alternative explanation in order to see that god means what he says 
Well, that's it. So they should, if somebody, that somebody should have a debate with you. That's what I think. Oh, I, I wish. Yeah, I, I wish. wish they would too. That would be very, very interesting. And we should be able to debate. We yeah. should be able to do that. And, and uh, because I came out of Word of Faith, people had to tell me I was wrong. Uh, I had to look into it and examine it and see where I missed it. And so we don't know everything and we learn things from each other. We so, should. Yeah, and yeah. we should. We should be open and maybe, well, I don't. I can say I don't agree. I, if I don't agree with something, I tell you. I don't agree with that. And if you don't agree with me, you tell me. I don't agree with that. So <laughs> we can still uh, fellowship. People can still fellowship together. But the way it is today that a lot of people, if they don't agree with you, then they're ready to write you off 100%. And uh, they don't even want to discuss it. Of course, this this is more of a difference of opinion in historical interpretation, history of of, of history, not it not doctrinal. Yeah, this really isn't doctrinal. Yeah, and so um, you know it has nothing to do with the person's salvation or any of the you know the major tenets of the church. So it has more to do with the interpretation of history according to God's promises. Yeah, to Israel. Yeah, to Israel, but that's a. That's a subject that... <laughs> no, no, people don't like to think about they us being grafted in. No, they don't like to... You know. do, yeah. Well, that's it. People have their certain ways and maybe something they heard or and they didn't investigate it for themselves. So Well, it's it's knee jerk because, you know, of so-called replacement replacement theology. Yeah. Uh, you know, no you one's replacing Israel. No, no one's replacing the Jews. Replaced. And no. and yet you just even talk about us being grafted in or or genetically where we all come from. That's like some some scary thing. What's scary about that? It ain't doctrinal. But no, anyway, well, that's another story. Yeah, Read it for well, yourself. That's it. Read it for yourself and then contact Jackie. So then and ask her questions. Don't just yeah. assume that you look at the title and you know what the book's about and you end of discussion because it says Israel on it. So <laughs> that's it. it. That's like, people don't like to talk about it. I don't know why they get touchy about it, but they do. But I anyway, I love Israel. I've been there twice. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. Talk, talk and discuss. And if you don't agree, say I don't agree, but you can still be nice. There you go. <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> yes, we can, we can still, because we still have so much more in common, and there's, but no, nobody knows everything. And uh, when it comes to her heresy, and it comes to wolves, and it comes to false doctrine, and things that are really going to hurt people, those kind of things we have to call out. Absolutely. And then you, you hope you can have a discussion with some of these people, but they don't talk to you. Even if you try, and I've tried to talk to some of these people. They, they don't talk to you. They don't answer your emails. They don't uh, try to call their offices. Uh, they hang up on you. They think you're a crackpot sometimes if you say certain things. And so it's frustrating. You would like to uh, talk to some of these people and have an intelligent conversation about doctrine and try to help them. And maybe hopefully some of them will repent. So that's what we would like to do. Yeah. All right, Jackie. So great program today. Thank you so much. Always my pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much for the great show. God bless. God bless. Bye. All right, everybody. That's our program for today. And so we talked about so many different things. And you might be saying, well, Susan, what am I supposed to do with my life? My life's so messed up. And can God ever forgive me? Yes, he can. He can forgive you. No matter what you've done or where you've been, Jesus loves you. He loved you enough to give his life for you. And he said, Jesus said in the third chapter of John, he said, ye must be born again. First you're born of your mother. Then you must be born again of the Spirit of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, his only begotten Son, that whoever, whosoever shall believe us on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So you can ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to come into your life. 
and to change your life. And he will. You say, that sounds too simple. It is. It is simple. It is simple. We mean it in your heart. You say it with your mouth because confession is made with the mouth unto salvation. And I can testify. When I was alone in a, in a hotel room one night and I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, if you're real, if you're really who you say you are, come into my life and change my life. And I'm truly sorry for all the things that I've done. And just like that, my life was changed. I woke up the next morning and my life was different. I thought different. I felt different. And I had a joy that I didn't have before. So you can't tell me that it's not real, that Jesus isn't real and it's not real to be born again because he is real. He's a savior and he can save you and give you peace and joy and all the things that money can't buy. God bless you. the